Hey everybody, this is Fulio of Echele Porras Productions and today we're gonna show you guys how to make some gobernador fries. All right, so the ingredients to gobernador fries are super simple. First of all, gobernador style can probably be overly simplified into a Baja style taco fry recipe. You would use shrimp as your protein and get like a Baja sauce, some, some cheeses, you know, all that you would encompass in a Baja style dish. So today we're using some shell and tail on shrimp. If you have some extra time, always go for the less trimmed option because they're cheaper. And really once they're thawed, it's a bit easy to get that shell off. So we have our shrimp, which we're going to marinate in our al pastor marinade that we made for our tacos, if you haven't checked that out. We're gonna add a bit of Old Bay seasoning to get that more Cajun flavor. Of course, you need your fries. Uh, you can make your own fries. We made some fries in the animal style fry video where we had curly fries and some homemade oven fries. You can do that yourself, but if you don't want to, you can buy some pre-made fries and there's nothing wrong with that. As I said, we're gonna be using our al pastor marinade that we made last time. Uh, if you need a quick refresher of what goes into that, we use some guajillo and ancho chiles, a can of chipotles and adobo, some cumin, thyme, oregano, salt, pepper, etc. If you want a full recap, you can go check out last week's Al Pastor Tacos video. We're also gonna be using some of our avocado lime crema that we also made for the Al Pastor Tacos. You're gonna want some cheese as well. Here we have some mozzarella and some cheddar. With the extra marinade we have left over, we're gonna mix that with some mayo and we're gonna make an Al Pastor mayo. We're gonna try it out and we're also gonna put that on top of the fries. So now we're going to deshell and detail our shrimp. There's a bunch of different ways to do this. If you find an easy way, do it the easy way. If you want to do it the cut everything off, go ahead. Now you can go ahead and remove the vein, but honestly it's not mandatory. So let's begin the long process of getting these shells off. All right. After you've deshelled, detailed, and deveined as many as you can tolerate in one day, we're gonna take what we got, get our al pastor marinade, and we're just gonna get it in there. Now, you don't want to overcoat these things. We just want enough that they'll get the flavor imparted in them. That should be enough for our purposes. I'm gonna mix that around a bit. Then we're gonna take a tablespoon of our Old Bay seasoning and you're just gonna put that over the top. And then you just mix. And then since this marinade is acidic, remember we put lemon juice, orange juice, and apple cider vinegar in it. We don't want these to sit too long because then they'll start being cooked by all the acids in the marinade and they'll start breaking down and they're gonna get all mushy. Kind of like when you have a traditional ceviche, the shrimp is squishier than I like personally, which is why when we made our ceviche, you can check it out. We cook the shrimp beforehand because I like the texture it gives. So we're just gonna let this sit for about 15, 20 minutes, then we'll take it outside and cook it off in the 360 griddle. So while we wait for the shrimp to marinate and the fries to cook, we're gonna be making our mayonnaise mixed with some of our remaining al pastor marinade. This thing in general just packs a whole bunch of flavor. Mixing it with the mayo is just gonna give it that nice creamy. This is just a vehicle to drive all those flavors into your mouth hole. We're just gonna start off with a couple scoops of mayo and some of your marinade. Now, how much depends on how much flavor you want of each. If you want more mayo flavor, put more mayo. If you want more marinade flavor, put more marinade. But what we're looking for is a nice creamy consistency that has that nice punch of marinade flavor. We'll mix it around, give it a taste, a little more marinade. Fuck it, we're using all the marinade. Now we just need to wait for those shrimp to come out and then we can take them out to the 360 grill. 
All right, we're back outside here with the Cuisinart 360 griddle. And as you can see, I'm still rocking my white shades. My new ones will get here, I think tomorrow. I'm gonna rock these shades like we know it. So the grill's ready, it's roaring hot. And the shrimp, since they're so tiny, should take no time at all to cook. By the time I place down my last shrimp, the first one should be ready to flip. We'll get these cooked off real quick. We'll go back inside, get the fries ready, and put the dish together. Let's get this started. So I've reduced the heat down to a medium, medium high, because we don't want these things scorching. I'm gonna put some oil down. Let's get our shrimp on. Fuck it. All right, so the shrimp shouldn't take long at all, about one or two minutes per side. So we'll probably be ready to flip that guy pretty soon here. And there's the color you want, that beautiful shrimp color. All right, we can get these suckers off the grill and we can get them inside and assemble our plate. All right, so we got our shrimp off the griddle and our fries out of the oven. We're gonna give these a quick seasoning and then we're going to assemble our dish. So we're just gonna hit it with a bit of garlic salt and you wanna do this while they're still hot because the seasoning will adhere better. Some garlic salt, a bit of our Old Bay so it gets that Cajun flavor. And next, we're going to add a bit of brown sugar. This is gonna cut through all the savoriness, all the saltiness that we have in the dish already and just give it a slight sweet note. If you like Wingstop fries, you like sugar in your fry seasoning. We're not gonna use a lot, we're gonna use about a half teaspoon. Get it in there. Also, you can add a little bit of oil to your fries so that all the seasonings stick and adhere. Just toss that in, in there and you should have a great tasting fry. Let's get to assembly. Here we have our trusty serving dish that we use in almost every video just because it's so nice and compact. It just makes everything look pretty when you put it on. So we're gonna start off with a bed of fries. Hit it with your cheeses some of our avocado lime crema. Some of our al pastor aioli. Top it off with some beautiful shrimp and garnish with some cilantro. If you have the time and ingredients, you can also make a nice pico de gallo to go with this, but we were out of tomatoes and onion. So we did the best with what we got, but there is our plate. Beautiful, sexy, and oh so delicious. You can drench this in sauce, you can drench this in cheese, you can drench this in whatever you want. Let's try this out. Get some of everything, some cheese, some sauce, some fries, and some shrimp. A second bite because I can. That's delicious. Woo! You get the creaminess of the two sauces, the nice and savory notes, and some of the chile of the al pastor marinade through that shrimp. Like I said, that little bit of brown sugar in the fries just adds another little dimension of flavor. It's like when people put pineapple on their pizza, even though I personally don't like it. It adds some sweetness through all the saltiness. Anyways, I don't have a cocktail for you this time. Uh, this was kind of just a quick down and dirty recipe that we were hungry. I was like, I have some shrimp, I have fries. Let's make some awesome governator fries. Uh, but if you got some Baileys, 
And you got some chocolate liqueur and you got some ice cream. Mix those together and you'll have an awesome adult shake. If you like the video, hit that like button. If you want to see what we're going to do next, hit that subscribe button. And as always, stay awesome, stay safe, peace. Hey everybody, this is Fulio of Echale Porros Productions. And today we're going to be showing you guys how to spatchcock and oven roast a whole chicken. Let's get to our beautiful bird. All right, so here we have our chicken. This is a pancha de pollita. What we're gonna do, if you haven't checked out the Thanksgiving video that we did almost a year ago, uh, we are gonna do what's called spatchcocking this bird. What spatchcock means is that we're gonna cut out its backbone and just lay it out flat. Because if you try to roast in this form factor and in the oven, your white meat is at the top, so it's getting a lot more heat. And your thighs and your legs are down here tucked below, which means that they're not getting as much of that heat that they need to get to their safe eating temperature. By the time the breasts get to their safe eating temperature, the thighs are still undercooked. And by the time the thighs and the legs get to their safe eating temperature, your breast is gonna be overcooked and dry. Anyways, enough rambling. Let's get this backbone cut out. What you're gonna do is you're gonna flip pancha. And if you have any little gizzards, like here's the liver, the heart, all that fun stuff that you get. So here's the cavity. This is the front side. These are the breasts. So we wanna keep this. What we're gonna do is we're gonna cut along the ribs and then we're gonna flip it over and flatten it out. You can use a sharp knife or you can use some good kitchen shears. Let's get at it. Here's the little tail. You wanna go slightly to the side of that and you're gonna start your cutting. There you have it, your chicken's backbone. Now you can keep all this, you can get rid of it, but what you can do is throw this all into a pot get it to a boil and make yourself a nice caldo de pollo at home. So you don't have to use your consomme or your chicken bouillon cubes or any of that. You can make it right at home. You can use all pieces of this bird. Now where you're in here, you're gonna wanna clean it up a bit. Here you still got some of the innards. You can take out some of the bones if you wish. One other thing is you're gonna wanna take your knife and here in the little breast connective bone, you're gonna wanna make a little slit cut down and that's gonna help us flatten our bird out. All right, we've cut what we can. We gave Pancha a flip and we are going to flatten this a bit more. Hopefully your CPR training came in or that episode of The Office that taught you how to do it. You're just gonna go down. You're gonna hear a nice crunch and as you can see here, our breasts are here, our thighs are here, our wings, we're gonna do a little finagling with them so these tips don't get burnt, but you can also just get rid of those as well. You can add that in with your backbone and your innards and your ribs, and you can make a nice stock with that. Now that we've got this nice and spatchcocked, we are gonna get to seasoning the bird. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna get our work our fingers in here and try to separate the skin from the meat just like we did with our turkey. But we're gonna be very careful not to pierce the skin because we want this to be dry. We want the skin to stay intact so all the meat inside cooks very well. And the skin, while for some people is very tasty, it also acts as a thermal barrier so that your breast and your thighs don't get overcooked and they stay nice and juicy because all that juice and all that flavor and all that fat is staying inside. So what we're gonna do, just get them in there, try and get all that connective tissue out of the way. Just be careful not to pierce the skin. And if you pierce the skin, it's not the end of the world. Everything will be okay. All right, we got one side of our breast. Let's go to the other side. I'm gonna expose Pancha's breasts. Now with your thigh, super easy. You can get the skin, pop that out and expose all that meat and you'll be able to get all your seasoning on here. And when you're done, just pop it back in. Boom, bunch of thick. 
All right, now that we got pancha nice and exposed, we're gonna go ahead and get our initial seasoning on. And you're gonna season both sides. Even though there's not a lot of meat down here, you still wanna get both sides seasoned so you can get the most flavor. Let's get it with a nice, generous coating. And then for a bit of Cajun flavor, we're gonna hit it with our Old Bay. And not only is this gonna give good flavor, it's gonna give a nice color to our chicken as well. Generous coating, a bit of cumin, and some basil. All right, once you got your bottom side nice and seasoned, we're gonna flip it over and work on our top side. Again, we're gonna hit it with some garlic salt, a bit of Old Bay, cumin, and some basil. You're then gonna cover your thighs up. Now we're going to expose our breasts and season them just the same way. Garlic salt, Old Bay, basil, and some cumin. Now you're gonna get your saggy grandma skin, get your skin and bring it back. Now, in addition to the seasoning directly on the meat, we're gonna season the skin a bit so it gets nice and dry and it creates a nice crust, whether you're a skin eater or not. Some garlic salt, your Old Bay, cumin, and some basil. Now that we have pancha all nice and seasoned, we're gonna put her aside and let it rest and let her rest or let it rest. Let's not assume this chicken's gender, even though it's a chicken and not a rooster. Anyways, we're gonna put it aside to rest, uh, let all the seasoning tack up, let the salt start doing its work, and we're gonna let it do what's called a dry brine. And then we're gonna make a compound butter that we're gonna put in between the skin on top of the meat, so that way it imparts even more flavor and you keep some juiciness. Let's get this to the side and let's start our butter. All right, so now we're gonna get started on our compound butter. Again, if you can make this the night before, wrap it up and get it in the fridge, that's gonna let the flavors melt together a lot better. But right now, we're hungry and we wanna get this done. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take one stick of butter, mix it around a bit, some parsley flakes, just to give it that nice pop of green, a bit more of our Old Bay, some of our salt-free seasoning, and a good dollop of garlic. Gonna get your handy dandy fork again, and you're gonna mix that in. Ooh, the aroma. Garlic and butter, what's better? Last but not least for our compound butter, we're gonna put the juice and zest of one lime. Bancha already has a bunch of savory flavors, so we wanna put some acid to kinda cut through that. All right, let's get Pancha back out here and get her covered in butter. So we have Pancha out here again on a bed of nice cauliflower and broccoli that we're also gonna roast along with this. We put it on the bottom. Usually you put it on the bottom to elevate it, but since we have a rack, that's not necessary. But all the nice fat drippings and all the juices from the chicken are gonna then go into the broccoli and the cauliflower, flavor that and we're gonna have some nice roasted veggies to go along with our roasted chicken. So now it's time to just kinda get down and dirty again. You're gonna wanna pop out your thighs again, pop off your breastesis, and just get your butter on there. And now that you've got pancha nice and buttered up, you're gonna get her in the oven. We have our oven set to 425 and we're gonna let this bird go for about 45 minutes to an hour. What we're looking for is for the meat to come up to a temperature of about 165 to 170. We're gonna pull it out and we're gonna show you how to carve it up. Let's get this baby in the oven. All right, Panchita is out of the oven and we let her rest for an additional 15 minutes after we got her out. So in total, it was 45 minutes of cook time and then 15 minutes to rest, so an hour total. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna carve her up. The easiest thing you can do now is to get the thighs off. Remember, oh, look at that, super easy. Remember, since we cut off the backbone, we also cut the connective bone between the thigh and the breast, so look at that. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Same with this side, take that off. And there you have it, your broken down chicken. 
Now you can go ahead and separate your thighs and your legs if you want, but that's a pretty good portion right there. Let's try it out. Here we have some of the breast meat. And as you can see here, super juicy is just running down my fingers. If you cook it perfectly, super juicy meat. So let's try it out. Let's try a bit of thigh meat as well. <clears throat> now we also have our veggies that got roasted and got marinated and basted and all that nice chicken juice butter, excess butter that came down. So go out into the world, use your newfound spatchcock roasted chicken recipe, go wow your family and a fraction of the time that it would usually take. If you like the video, hit that like button. And if you want to see what we do next, hit the subscribe button and the little bell next to it. And as always, stay safe, stay awesome, peace. Hey everybody, this is Fulio of Echele Porras Productions. And today we are going to be making a ribeye steak bagel sandwich with some chimichurri sauce. Today's recipe is gonna be simpler than most of our other ones. It's really just seasoning your steak, cooking it, slicing it, putting it on some sandwich bread, and there you go. For our ingredients today, we are gonna be using a ribeye steak that we got from Target. We're also gonna be using some brie cheese to add some of that creaminess. And really, if you wanna use cream cheese because you can't find brie, go ahead. Cream cheese is actually what I was originally going to use because I made this sandwich once at work for lunch, but I was like, let's fancy it up with some brie cheese. We're also gonna be using our chimichurri sauce, which if you have the time to make your own, go ahead. Originally, I was gonna use pesto. We are gonna be using some sweet peppers that we're just gonna chop up and put them in there. We don't have to cook them, they're really good raw. If you don't have sweet peppers, just go out and get some red and orange bell peppers because those have the sweetest taste. And last but not least, we're gonna be using some everything bagels. Really, you can use any bread you want, some French bread, some just regular sandwich bread, but we're gonna go with bagels because I like how it looks. Let's get to seasoning our steak. We're gonna keep it super simple. We're just gonna go salt, pepper, and a little bit of the salt-free seasoning to give it more of a crunch. So let's get to that. Once again, to season our steak, we're just gonna coat it with some Worcestershire sauce. Just to get the seasoning to adhere to it, this isn't to add flavor. You could use oil, you can use uh, mustard, you can use basically anything here to put on your steak. I know I said we were gonna use garlic salt, pepper, and salt-free seasoning for this steak, but we have some steakhouse seasoning that we're gonna use, which basically has all of that in it already. We're just gonna go with a generous coating. Generous. And you can see this has some bigger pieces of salt, some dried onions, some garlic, some pepper, some crushed red pepper so it's gonna really give a nice ooh mix of flavors for this so we're just gonna let this soak in for a bit and then we'll flip Worcestershire steakhouse seasoning let that tack up and we are basically ready to get this thing outside and on the 360 griddle we have it preheating high heat we're gonna go a couple minutes per side and just keep flipping it so we get that to that nice internal temperature of about 130 for rare, medium, rare meat. And then we'll pull it off, let it cool down, and continue with our sandwich. Let's go outside and cook this baby off. So in case you were wondering what goes into a steakhouse seasoning, really all it is is salt, garlic, black pepper, red pepper, dill, some celery seed, and you're set. So basically all the stuff we had that we were gonna put together from our other seasonings all in one. Dollar Tree, homie. All right, we're back outside with the Cuisinart 360 griddle. I got my regular glasses back, so I don't have to be rocking my wife's awesome shades, but let's get to this. We're just gonna get it on the grill. It's already preheating, it's hot. We're gonna get it right in the center on top of some oil, and we'll flip it about every two minutes to one minute. We'll be checking the temperature constantly to get it to that nice internal 
rare medium rare temperature so we get that nice reddish steak so let's get it on and that is a gorgeous sound all right it's been about two minutes we're gonna flip just listen to that baby roar and put some butter we're actually gonna take another piece of butter put it under so we get both sides of this steak. Let that go for another minute or two. We'll check the temp real quick. Still got a ways to go. So we'll just leave it on there. Our internal temp is good. Let's get our steak off. And we'll let it rest for a bit. We're back inside, we have our little Merka looking steak resting here with some butter on it. So now we are gonna get ready and start making the rest of the components of our sandwich, which is not hard at all. Here we have an everything bagel and some peppers. I chose one of each color to get that color pop because you eat not only with your mouth, with your nose, but you also eat with your eyes. We have our brie cheese and we have our chimichurri sauce. Once we get our steak cut up, we're gonna put the chimichurri sauce on it so it melts into it and incorporates in there. Then we'll put the sandwich together. What we're gonna do first is just get your bagel, cut it in half, and throw it in the toaster. We're gonna get our peppers, just cut off the top. You just cut it in half, get your seeds out. There's your peppers. And we're just gonna julienne these or something like a julienne. Really, we're just gonna cut it into nice thin strips so that way we don't get too much. But even then, they're nice and tasty. If you want, just cut them in half, cut them in half again. We got our peppers, and now it's time to cut into our steak. So I noticed my thermometer thingy was acting a little wonky, so if it's not perfect, it's okay because it's still food. He made food, congratulations. So we're just gonna go down the middle. And look, it's a little more medium, a little more pinkish than red, but that's fine, as long as it's not well done, because then it's just fucking burnt. But look, it's still ribeye steak, it's still gorgeous, and it's still gonna taste awesome. Whoa, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> At a bias. <laughs> and really, if there's anything you want to take away, if you want to go in and take out some of the little cartilage in between, because that's chewy and that doesn't really render down, but you can do whatever you want. It's your food. Don't let anybody else tell you what you're doing is wrong. Unless you're washing your chicken raw. Then you're doing something wrong. So we'll get some chimichurri. Just put it over the top. Let those flavors start melding in. You can go heavy, you can go light. Really, it's up to your preference as usual. Someone's gonna be like, that's way too much chimichurri. Someone's gonna be like, that's way too little chimichurri. Don't give a fuck. This one's calling my name. Gorgeous. Juicy. That chimichurri just gives it a nice funk. Gives it a nice acid to cut through the meat cut through that butter to cut through that salt that we had from the seasoning really just really good our bagels ready let's get it out let's make the sandwich all right we got our bagel we got our peppers we got our cheese we got our steak let's put this bitch together like I said if you don't have brie cheese you can just use cream cheese once you get in there really creamy pull apart it's like half melted cheese toast your bagels however you want I like them a little more toasty. Just put your cheese, it's not the prettiest right there, but it's gonna be covered by gorgeousness. Put our steak. And then put your peppers. You can cook off these peppers, but I like them raw just cause I like the textural difference that's gonna give. And really the flavor is there. It's a gorgeous flavor. Arrange this however you want. Really, it's just a gorgeous sandwich for you. And there you have it. 
yo sandwich. Let's cut into this baby. We got some pepper down. There you have it. Pepper, steak, cheese, all the gorgeousness. Pretty simple. If you wanna go simpler, go ahead. Cream cheese with steak, awesome. Add some peppers on that, awesome. Add some kale, you're a little weird. But make it how you want and make sure it's gorgeous. Let's try it out. I haven't said it in a while, but I make some good shit. If you liked the video, hit the like button. And if you want to see what we're going to be up to next, hit the subscribe button. As always, stay safe, stay awesome. Peace. Hey guys, this is Vale, and today we're going to be making a molten chocolate lava cake. So for your ingredients, you're going to have one half cup of powdered sugar, one fourth cup of flour, one eighth teaspoon of salt, one half cup or one stick of butter, two eggs, two egg yolks, and six ounces of semi-sweet chocolate. Next, we're gonna be chopping up our chocolate. Usually, I just use a serrated edge knife. It just helps make the chopping easier. And we're gonna cut them into little bite-sized pieces. Then we're gonna be putting our butter into a microwave-safe bowl and our chocolate on top. So after we put the chocolate in the bowl, we're gonna microwave it in 15 second intervals until fully melted and sweet. Now we're gonna mix our dry ingredients, our flour, our powdered sugar, and our salt. Just whisk that together till it's all combined. Then we're gonna mix our eggs, our two egg yolks, and our two eggs. Now into another bowl, we're gonna place our melted chocolate in, our eggs, and our dry ingredients. So I usually use a spatula to mix, but if there's any large bumps, you can get rid of them with a whisk. Now I'm gonna butter my four six ounce ramekins with just some melted butter, and then we're gonna put some cocoa powder into them so they don't stick. Now we're gonna put them onto a baking sheet and divide our batter evenly or as evenly as we can into the four of them. So now we're going to put them in at 350 degrees Fahrenheit for about 12 to 14 minutes. You just want the sides to look a little firm, but the tops to be soft. So after they come out of the oven, we're going to let them cool for a minute or two after that, we're going to turn them out onto a plate. Be sure to wear your gloves as it's still really hot. So you can top them using whatever you want. Today, I'm using some ice cream. And here, we're just going to cut into it. You can also top it with just some whipped cream and a strawberry like we did here. Now let's cut into this one. And there you have it, your molten chocolate lava cakes. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe. And if you want to see more desserts from me, be sure to let us know down below. Bye, guys. Hey, everybody. This is Fulio of Echele Porros Productions. And today, we're going to be showing you guys how to make a quick and simple pesto sauce. The process to make a pesto is actually pretty simple. There's just a couple ingredients you need, and then you can use either a food processor, molcajete, or a blender to mix it all together. The main ingredient you're gonna be needing is some basil, because this is where that smell, that aroma comes from. It has a nice punchy smell that's gonna punch you in the nose, but it's gonna feel good at the same time. I usually do some fresh basil and then augment it with some dry basil just to get that variety. You're gonna need some Parmesan cheese, 
Here we have some shaved Parmesan. If you have the powder, that works just as well. Uh, if you have the actual block, you just need to grate that down a bit, but any type of Parmesan works. You're gonna need some good olive oil or really any kind of oil, as long as it's an olive oil or a neutral tasting oil. I've done it with a canola oil before and it turned out just fine. If you can't get an olive oil, get a neutral tasting oil like canola. Another main ingredient, pesto, is garlic. So here we have already minced garlic. If you have fresh garlic cloves, that works. Uh, garlic paste, that works. Basically, any way to get garlic in there, probably even if all else fails, a garlic powder. Sure, work with what you got. Just make sure you got some garlic in there. And then to add some punch to it, some red pepper flakes. Now, normally in a traditional pesto, you would have some kind of nut like pine nuts, damia, walnuts, some cashews, just any kind of nut, but it's not necessary. It just adds some textural difference when you're eating it. My lovely wife is allergic to nuts, and really, I haven't tasted a difference between a pesto I've made with and without nuts. In addition to basil, what a lot of more modern restaurants have been doing is they add some spinach or they do some some kale so it's a spinach pesto or a kale pesto so what we're doing today is adding spinach and kale to our pesto why because we bought these big ass bags and if we don't use them they'll go bad and honestly we don't eat that much kale by itself other than smoothies. Spinach we probably use a bit more, but might as well get rid of them both in one fell swoop. So if you don't have a large amount of basil, you can still make a good amount of pesto by substituting in some spinach and some kale. They don't have as much flavor on their own, so the basil will still overpower and be that predominant flavor that we're looking for. So let's move on to our next step. All right, so here we have all our leafy greens laid out. We have our basil, spinach, and our kale. So what we're gonna do, even though we're putting these in a food processor and they're gonna get off nice and chopped up, we're still gonna help it along a bit by taking these bigger leaves, and just chopping them up to size. The kale itself actually comes a bit pre-chopped, so we're just gonna take that and put it in our processor. So now what we're left with is our basil and our spinach. An easy way to chop up any type of leafy green uh, is you want to take one of the larger leaves and just pile your other leaves on top of it. And I think we've gone over this before in our spinach artichoke dip video, which you can check out. Then what you're going to do is you're going to roll this up, get your knife, and start slicing out your ribbons. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. That's just gonna help your blender, your food processor, your whatever you're using. It's just gonna help the process go a lot smoother. Now you can keep the stems in there, you can take them out, but I like to leave them in for anything. Uh, cilantro, spinach, basil, cause that's, those stems have a lot of that flavor and aroma we're looking for. So by throwing those away or getting rid of them or not using them, you're, you're kind of, you're wasting flavor. Now that you've got your greens cut up to whatever consistency you want, it's all going in the food processor. So what we're gonna do first is we're gonna give this a couple quick pulses and then we'll start adding our other ingredients. So let's do a quick, couple quick, let's do a couple quick pulses. We pulsed it a couple times it's starting to settle. You see that the greens are starting to, to intermingle. So now we're gonna add our garlic. For our recipe, we're gonna go with two tablespoons of garlic because we like garlic. This is a large amount of greens and it's gonna hopefully be a good amount of pesto. So we're gonna put enough garlic to sustain it. We're also gonna go with a tablespoon of crushed red peppers. We're also gonna add two teaspoons of garlic salt. We're gonna go with a tablespoon of dry basil, again, just to intensify these basil flavors. And then we're gonna go with a half cup of our shaved Parmesan. 
get that in. All that in there. We're gonna get our lid. Put that back on there and we're gonna let this mix together. We're gonna pulse it probably just a bit just to get the ingredients distributed evenly and then we're just gonna let it ride. And while it's processing, we're gonna be pouring our olive oil through our little spout. We'll probably go for a quarter cup to begin with and then we'll see how our consistency is from there. Let's start this thing up. Let's pulse it a bit. And now let's let it go. All right, so we've let it go for a bit. We're gonna take our spatula and we're gonna get these rest of these ingredients down off the side. Ooh, it just punches you right in the nose, but you like it, like a cochino. All right, look at that, sexy. Look at that, you can still see the red pepper flake the greens, all the greens have kind of mixed together, but you still get that nice, powerful basil smell. You can still see the red pepper flake, you can see the Parmesan, and the aroma is just awesome. Like I said, you can't notice that there's any spinach or kale in there, and really, you'd probably never be able to tell. Let's give it a small taste. I can't wait to use this throughout the week. You can make some nice pesto pasta with this, which I believe we've already done for our Tuscan chicken and our chicken parmesan episodes. You can check those both out. We started with a fourth cup of oil and we did add about another fourth cup or so. So about a half cup in total to get this consistency. And what you're gonna do now is take this, put it in a container and put it in the refrigerator at least overnight until you actually use it in a dish because you're gonna let all those flavors just intensify and meld and, and mature in there. But really, if you wanted to throw this on a pasta right now, you wanted to throw it on a sandwich, you could, totally. That's how simple it is to make pesto. It tastes good, it smells awesome, and it's super simple to make. Again, for traditional pesto, all you need is basil, garlic, Parmesan, oil, and optional tree nuts. If you like this recipe, hit the like button. And if you wanna see what we do next, hit the subscribe button. We wanna thank everyone who's subscribed, who's watching, who, who supported the channel. We just recently hit 100 subscribers at Chile Porras Productions. We did it in less than a year. Hopefully we just keep shooting up. Maybe one day we'll have that 1,000 subscriber special. And a million of subscribers after that. Thank you. Uh, share this with your friends, family, anyone who wants to know how to make pesto. And as always, stay safe, stay awesome. Peace. Hey everybody, this is Fulio of Echele Porros Productions. And today we're revisiting pizza and showing you guys how to make a barbecue chicken pizza. Let's start off with our dough. So we've already gone over how to make the dough we're using in our last pizza episode, but just a quick refresher, we're gonna go over it again. So what you're gonna start off with is three cups of all-purpose flour. Uh, I know this container, so I know it's three cups, so I'm just gonna pour the whole thing in there. A tablespoon of salt, a teaspoon of sugar, two tablespoons of olive oil, a cup of warm water, and last but not least, and probably most important, your yeast. So today, we're using instant yeast. So with this one, you just need to toss it in with your dry ingredients, and it should work no problem. Last time we used active yeast, which we had to bloom in warm water for about 10 minutes. What you would do with active yeast is you would get a warm water between 100 and 110 degrees, put it in there, mix it around, and let it sit for about 10 minutes until it starts to bubble. That way you know it's alive. But with instant yeast, you can just chuck it in there and it works no problem. So let's get our food processor out. All right, let's get started with our dough. As I said, three cups of flour. I know this container is three cups, so I'm just gonna chuck it all in there. Add to that a tablespoon of salt or garlic salt or whatever salt you use, but a tablespoon. 
a teaspoon sugar, and your instant yeast. Again, since this is instant, we're just gonna chuck it in there. That's our basic dry ingredients for our dough. You can experiment with that a bit by putting red pepper flakes, basil, oregano to enhance the flavor. But here's the basics, and that's what we're gonna go with for today. So now what we're gonna do is we're just gonna start it and let it mix. We're gonna pour in our water, we're gonna pour in our oil, and we're gonna let that mix together and let it go for about a minute. And then we're gonna take it out, put it in a bowl, cover it, and just let it sit for three hours. So let's get to that. Now that you've formed your dough, you're gonna take it, form it into a ball, put it in a nice oiled container, cover it with some plastic wrap, and just let it sit. Previously in the last episode, if you haven't checked it out, last episode we said you just need to let it sit for an hour, which is true. You can let it go for an hour and make it from there. The dough will be a little hard to stretch when you're rolling it out, but you can still make great pizza if you let it sit for an hour. We have a little bit of time today, so we're gonna let it sit for three hours, and then we're gonna continue with our pizza. So, let's get it out. Watch your fingers with the blade. You're just gonna form it a bit, pinch the bottom, and there's your bowl. You're gonna get your oiled bowl and plop it in. Now, you're just gonna cover it with plastic wrap, let it sit in a warmish place for about three hours, we're gonna come back and we're gonna make pizza goodness. All right, so it's been about three to four hours and our dough is ready. As you can see, it's puffed up quite nicely. We're gonna take two fingers and we're gonna watch out, watch out. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna get this out onto our parchment paper, divide it up and start making our pizzas. Get into a nice ball again. You can see it's nice and firm. It's nice and springy, you press it, and it springs back. That's what you want in a dough. So we're gonna take this, we're gonna split it in half. Put the other one to the side, and let's roll this bitch out. Since we don't have a rolling pin, we're gonna use our handy dandy wine bottle. All right. So now that we got our pizza rolled out, we're gonna get our ingredients ready. As I said, we're gonna be making a barbecue chicken pizza. So what we need for that is some chicken. Here, I just have some boiled chicken, boring chicken that I pulled a bit of it that I'm gonna top the pizza with. We're gonna use some jalapenos to add some spice and some flavor. Some red onion, because red onion with this barbecue pizza goes really well together. Mozzarella cheese. Simple. And for our barbecue, we're gonna use a chipotle barbecue. Uh, I just bought one of these bottles, emptied it out into a blender, added a can of chipotle peppers, and that was that. So for these jalapenos, we're just gonna get them in their little medallions, put those to the side. And then for our onion, we're just gonna chop it into little strips. So. and they're ready. Let's bring back our pizza and let's get this hot. So first we're gonna go with the layer of our chipotle barbecue. We're gonna try to be fancy here. Just go. Bit of a spiral. Spread that around a bit. You're gonna get your queso with a nice layer. Doesn't have to be too thick, but just enough to cover. Gonna go with your chicken. Just spread it out as much or as little as you want, like with most pizzas. Just careful that you don't overload it with toppings, because once you start overloading with toppings, 
the crust takes a lot longer to cook and you might get soggy crust. Some gelatinos, some jalapeno business, your red onion, your onion, get the onion and peel the onion and put the onion on your pizza. All right, that looks good. We're gonna leave it like that. We're gonna get it not in our oven. We're actually gonna cook this on our Cuisinart 360 griddle, which has been preheating because it's an experiment and I wanna try it. So let's take this outside. So we're outside once again with the Cuisinart 360 griddle and it's been heating up and actually we skipped the part. We didn't come out here to show you that we put the pizza on the grill. We came out here to show you how it looks once it's completed. Let's check it out. Look at that pizza. Sexy, beautiful, definitely gonna be delicious. And there we have it. Barbecue chicken pizza. It smells great. It looks great. The crust on the bottom is a little bit overdone, but that's because I haven't done a pizza on my griddle yet. But the top looks great, and it's nice and beautiful. Let's cut into this. Give it a try. Even with the bit of overdone crust, it tastes really good. And that barbecue brings that moistness you need. So it all balances out the chicken, the jalapeno, the red onion, delicious. Can't ask for more than that. If you like the recipe, hit that like button. And if you wanna keep up with what we're gonna make next, hit that subscribe button. As always, stay safe, stay awesome, Hey everybody, this is Fulio and Vale of Echele Porros Productions and today we're going to be showing you guys how to make some lemon cookies. So let's start off with our ingredients. First, we're going to have one half cup or one stick of unsalted butter. We're going to have one egg, three fourths cup of sugar, one and one half tablespoon of lemon juice and one and one half tablespoon of lemon zest, one half teaspoon of vanilla, one half teaspoon of baking powder, one fourth teaspoon of baking soda, one fourth teaspoon of salt, and one and one fourth cup of flour. Let's get started. In a large mixing bowl, we're gonna mix our softened butter and our three fourths sugar. So with your spatula, you're going to want to smash your butter and sugar together just to get it nice and combined. Bate, bate, this is how we do it. This is how we make it. So now we're going to add in our one egg. Just mix that. Always be sure to scrape down the sides of your bowl just to make sure that everything gets incorporated. Now we're gonna add our one half teaspoon of vanilla extract, as well as our tablespoon and a half of lemon. And then we're gonna add our one tablespoon and a half of lemon juice. Now we're gonna mix this all together. All right, so now into a separate bowl, we're going to measure out one and one fourth cup of flour. So I like to just scoop it up with the spoon and then take the other side and just level it off. This is the one fourth. Now we're gonna add in one half teaspoon of baking powder, one fourth of salt and one fourth teaspoon of baking soda. Now we're just gonna mix that all together. 
Okay, back into our main bowl, we're gonna add in our dry ingredients and just mix that up. So once again, be sure that you scrape down the sides just to make sure that everything is fully incorporated. Okay, so we're gonna drop around tablespoon size balls onto your parchment lined baking sheet. Put them about like an inch or two apart just to make sure that they don't hit each other while baking. So make sure your oven is preheated to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. We're gonna put these in for about 10 to 12 minutes. All right, so our cookies were in the oven for about 11 minutes. We let them cool. Now we put them out onto a plate. So we have our professional taste cookie taste tester here. Mami, echale porra. Okay, go ahead, try one. I think Perfect. these are really good, really lemony. They're soft and it's like you can eat three or four at a time and not even notice. Let me try one myself. <laughs> one of my favorite cookies. I think it was chocolate chip, oatmeal, cranberry. That's right, cranberry oatmeal, mm -hmm. lemon, etc. Anyways, there you have it. Lemon cookies. Sweet treats by Vale. We hope you liked the video. If you did, <laughs> smash that like button and make sure you subscribe so you can keep up to date with all our recipes. We got some more baking, we got some pizza, we got everything under the sun. We're gonna try and pick it up again. Smash the like button, hit the subscribe button, Make sure you ring the little bell next to it so you know when our next video comes out. And as always, stay safe, stay awesome. Peace. Mmm, cookies. Hey everybody, this is Fulio of Echele Porros Productions. And today we're gonna be showing you guys how to make a pastel azteca in salsa roja. So, to kind of simplify a pastel azteca into its base form, it's kind of just a Mexican lasagna or a big ass enchilada that's just stacked and stuff. An enchilada lasagna, maybe. Let's go with that. Enchilada lasagna. But instead of pasta, we're gonna be using tortillas. So what we need to do first is get started with our base salsa. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a couple tomatoes in our case, about six, seven tomatoes, jalapenos, onions, some ancho chiles, and some guajillo chiles. We're gonna put that all in a pot and get it boiling together. While that's going, we're also gonna take our chicken. In our case right now, we have skin on and bone in chicken thighs. You can use breast if you want as well. There, there's a lot of people that swear on that they only eat chicken breasts and some people that only swear they eat chicken thighs. Really, it doesn't matter. Breasts, thighs, throw in a pork butt and you got a beautiful lady. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> We're also gonna get those boiling off so once they're done, we can get them out and just shred them. We have some bell peppers, green and red for that color pop. And I really like the flavor of red bell peppers when they're a bit roasted off. Originally, instead of the green bell peppers, I was gonna use fresh poblanos, but on this day, we decided to go shopping for ingredients. There were no poblanos. So that's why we're using the ancho chiles because anchos are just smoked poblano chiles. And we're gonna hope to get that smoky poblano flavor from there. Cause I was gonna fire roast them, take off the skin, and it was gonna be gorgeous. But you make adjustments and really, the base is your salsa. A salsa roja can have so many iterations. If you wanted to go super spicy, you could. If you wanted to go super mild, you can do that as well. We're also gonna be using some corn for the filling in between, just to add some texture and some color pop, which is why this looks so beautiful. It's all colorful, it's all red and greens, and we got the lights in the background. We're also gonna be using some cheese to put in between. 
Here we have some queso quesadilla, as Walmart calls it. Uh, usually, quesadilla queso is queso de chihuahua. So, let's say queso de chihuahua, except the generic brand version. You could also use queso Oaxaca or just regular mozzarella cheese or any cheese in general. It's just you need that cheesy layer in between because like we said, we're going Mexican lasagna. So tortilla, your salsa roja, your chicken, your cheese, boom, etc. And if you wanted to add more veggies to this, you could. We're just using this today and you can build off this base. So let's get all of this shit into different pots and start getting it boiled off. All right, so on the stove right now, we have all our veggies. This pot has our tomatoes, our onions, and our jalapenos, along with the ancho and guajillo chiles. We're gonna bring that up to a boil, but let it simmer for a little bit, not too much. We're kind of just looking for when the tomatoes skin starts to crack and then we'll pull it off put it in a blender and blend that shit up over here we have our chicken thighs we're gonna bring this to a boil take it down to low heat and let it simmer for about five to ten minutes since they're chicken thighs they can go a little longer since they are dark meat our chicken thighs they have their skin on they have their bone in so hopefully we get a really flavorful caldo right here to amplify the flavor we are going to put in two bay leaves because the flavor that the bay leaf brings, even though it's really subtle, it's really flavorful and makes an impact. If not taste, you'll definitely smell the difference and half of being able to taste your food is being able to smell your food. Let's get the lids on and just let those go. All right, so both of these things are ready. Our salsa mixture is nice and boiling and the tomatoes are separating from their skin. So we're gonna take that off the heat. And our chicken has been, at this point, simmering for about 10 minutes. And it, as well, is ready to come off the heat. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna get all our veggies into our blender. We're gonna blend it up. We're gonna take a bit of this chicken stock as well. Now that we've boiled the chicken in the water, it's become a chicken stock. And since it's also had the bones and the skin in there, it's a bit more flavorful. So we're gonna take a bit of that and blend it into the salsa as well. So let's get that ready. Let's get these into our blender. All right, so we have everything in our blender. We're gonna pulse it a couple times and then we're just gonna let it go until it's nice and smooth or to your preferred consistency. All right, now that our salsa has been blended and it's ready to go, we're gonna get started with sauteing the onions, the bell peppers, and the corn. So let's get that in. Your onion, red bell pepper, and some green, and our green bell pepper. Go Dodgers. You're gonna let that go and cook down for a bit. And then after we'll add some garlic and our corn. Now that your onions and peppers have cooked down a bit and you switch to a bigger pot because you realize that going on with the smaller pan would overcrowd, you're gonna add in some garlic and your corn. Mix that around a bit. And as you can see, it's a beautiful color. It's gonna look beautiful on the plate, in the dish, whatever. If you have a beautiful color, that's probably about a fourth of the battle. Look, taste, smell, presentation. So let's let this cook down a bit and then we'll add our salsa. In. Once you've cooked down your veggies to whatever consistency you like them to be at, we're gonna add in our salsa. And then we're gonna let it go and simmer for about 10 minutes before we add our chicken. Mix that around, let that come up to temperature, and we let it simmer. While we wait for our salsa and veggie mixture to reduce a bit, we're gonna be taking a pan full of some oil, and we're gonna be frying off some tortillas that will act as our pasta substitution. 
So we're gonna fry them off a bit, put them to the side, and then use them as our base. We fry them so they don't get too soggy once they're introduced into the mixture and to give them some more flavor and texture. Doesn't have to be a deep fry. They don't have to be from tortilla chips. They just have to get some color and some texture. So check that out. It has some color and it has some texture. It was only in there for about 30 seconds, but that's what we're looking for. We're gonna put this off to the side so it cools down. We're gonna keep doing that with the rest of our tortillas. We're gonna go about three layers for this pastel azteca. So we're gonna get the rest of our salsa ready and then we can start building this thing. All right, this thing has come to a boil and we've let it simmer for a bit. Then we're gonna turn off our heat and reintroduce our chicken. We've turned off the heat because the chicken is already cooked and we don't want to overcook it anymore. So we're just going to let the chicken mingle in there for a bit and we'll be ready to plate. We've mixed it around a bit. Let's go back to our cutting board and assemble this bitch up. So we are finally ready to put our pastel azteca together. Make sure you preheat your oven to 375 for when we are done here. So get yourself a oven safe baking dish. We're going to start off with a bit of our mixture to go along the bottom. We've cut our tortillas in half so they can easily fit into the bowl or into your dish. We're gonna go about two tortillas for each layer. So once you got your layer down, you get your mixture and just pour that over top. As much or as little as you want for each layer. And once you got that layer in, you're gonna go back with your queso quesadilla or your queso chihuahua, your queso oaxaca, your mozzarella, whatever cheese you got. Put that in, good layer. And we also made an avocado lime crema for this that we're gonna put with each layer. I think we made it in our Al Pastor video, our Sonoran hot dogs video, so you can go check those out. We will get these written down eventually, so be on the lookout for that. So we're just gonna get some of our crema and get that on there. This ain't gonna be too pretty because I didn't put it in a squeeze bottle. Spread that in and onto the next layer. And that is ready to go in the oven. We're gonna put it in, remember at 375 for about 30 to 40 minutes or until the cheese is nice and melted and you can see the salsa nice and bubbly on the edges. So let's get this in and we'll see you back here in a bit. And there you have it. Pastel Azteca. Real quick before we go any further, remember that when you're making your salsa or your chicken, always season your dish. It's kind of a common sense thing, but my wife told me to remind you guys because I didn't show you when I put salt or pepper. A good basic for every dish is salt, pepper, and garlic powder. You can never go wrong with that. So, Let's try our pastel. I don't feel like cutting into this, so we thought ahead and made a smaller one. So let's try it out. And I have some of the crema on top there. Nice cheese layer on the top of that. You can see the tortilla, you can see the peppers. Look at that. As I said before, the bell peppers and the corn, while adding flavor, add good color to the dish which just makes things look prettier. I mean, you want your food to look and taste good. So let's try it out. That's hot. It's a bit hot, which is the question. Do you guys wait till your food cools down or do you <laughs> until you're able to eat it, <laughs> until you're able to chew and swallow it correctly? <laughs> I usually go because I'm impatient, but we're waiting. Oh, big boy. <laughs> that is <clears throat> purity. That is really good. It just tastes like a enchilada lasagna, like I said before. The cheese, the chicken, the salsa, the veggies, like the, the corn and the bell pepper help add some more texture to the bite and deliver a bit of sweetness, especially with that red bell pepper that 
kind of helps you navigate through all the savory that the salsa is. The crema as well just adds a little bit of freshness that's needed. So that's delicious. And I'm hungry. It's been a while. What was that? <sighs> My director is telling me to put more effort into this, but I can't work. It's hot. That I turned off the oven. Good. The oven was making it hot in here. Anyways, if you like the dish, hit the like button. And if you want to see what we're going to come up with next, hit the subscribe button. Thank you to everyone who's supporting. We're, we're growing. It feels awesome. Share the channel with a family member, a coworker, whoever wants to learn how to make a pastel azteca or anything else that we've made before. Just thank you. And a special shout out to Oscar Gonzalez, who gave us the idea way back when. I know it's been a while, but you know, finally we got around to it. But thank you for the idea to make a pastel azteca. It was definitely worth it. Uh, if you have any suggestions or want to see anything else from us be sure to let us know down in the comments below on social media facebook twitter instagram anywhere you want to see something from us we'll try it i've never done this before even though it's just a big enchilada but okay we'll try it hit the like button subscribe to the channel share it with your friends families acquaintances random people on the side of the street maybe they'll want a good food channel and as always stay safe Stay awesome. Peace. Hey everybody, this is Fulio of Echele Porras Productions. And today we're going to be showing you guys how to make some awesome cow zones. Let's go over what we're going to need for the dish. So to start off, the dough for our cow zones or our calzones will be the exact same dough we used for our pizza recipes, which we've done twice before. We did it for our original pepperoni and pesto pizzas, and then last time when we did our barbecue chicken pizza on the Cuisinart 360. Uh, we won't go over the full process, but we will tell you what we need. If you want to go check out those videos to see the full process to make the dough, we'll put their little links up here and we'll put the links down in the description below. Here we have our dough and we're just going to do our little wachas and it looks gorgeous. In this dough, I put some red pepper flake in there to add a little more oomph to it. So that's our dough. Same proportions as last time, it's just three cups of flour, one cup of water, one pack of instant dry yeast, one tablespoon of salt or garlic salt or whatever you want, a teaspoon of sugar and two tablespoons of oil. Usually olive oil, but if you don't got olive oil, it's okay. You're gonna put that in a food processor or you're gonna mix it by hand and then you're gonna let it rest for what we usually do is three hours now. You can do as little as an hour if you don't have the time. For one of our calzones, we're gonna be making a meat lovers. So what we're gonna use is some pepperoni, some thick cut ham, we're gonna dice up a sachicha, we're gonna use some bacon. We're gonna chop up some red onion to give it a little pop and a little more bite. We're gonna envelop that with some mozzarella cheese and we're gonna be golden. Our second calzone is going to be using our spinach artichoke dip, which we recorded some time ago. Uh, we'll put that in the description too. But we're gonna be using our spinach artichoke dip as the filling for the other calzone, my wife's calzone. <laughs> my wife's calzone that we're gonna be making. So, for the spinach artichoke dip, Really simple, you're just gonna get a block of cream cheese, a fourth cup of both mayo and sour cream, some regular mozzarella cheese, probably about another fourth cup of heavy cream if you want it to be more creamy. You're gonna chop up some artichokes, chop up some spinach, as much or as little as you want, and just toss it in there with some seasonings like salt, pepper, garlic powder, and some red chili flakes for some oomph. To see the full video, you can check it out down in the description below. And our third and final calzone is just gonna be a simple pepperoni and cheese. 
regular pizza pie type shit. What we're gonna do first is dice up all our carne and we're gonna brown them off in a pan with some oil real quick. Let's get to it. It doesn't matter how you cut your meats, just make sure they're all even because evenly diced or cut food is gonna cook at the same time and you're not gonna have any undercooked or overcooked pieces. The same thickness, same size. So there's the ham. We're gonna do our sachicha, which is the same type of sachicha we use for our Sonoran hot dog video. We'll have this linked in the description below. And if it's not in the description below, you can send me a message to our social medias or leave a comment and say, dude, you forgot this shit. And I'll be like, my bad, I'll put it up. Then we're gonna take our bacon. And with our bacon, we're just gonna cut it into little strips, what they call lardons, lardonis. And we're gonna get that into a separate pan. And remember, when you're doing bacon, always cook it in a cold pan because that's gonna allow you to render out that fat and cook the bacon a lot more evenly. So let's get these in our pots and we will be back in a minute. All right, so we have our sachichas and ham nice and browned. We have our bacon cooked, we have our onions cut up and we are almost ready for assembly. I have the dough balls here that have been chilling. We have our oven preheating to 425. And last thing we need to do before we start rolling these out is work with our roasted red pepper, which has been steaming in this bag. We're gonna take it out, take off its skin, and get it into nice slices. Let's get this sucker out. And there it is, all weird looking. What we're gonna do first is we're just gonna get the top off. We're gonna take out the seeds. We're gonna give it a nice cut lay it down and just scrape off the flesh so we get that nice tender skin underneath it what we're going to do here is just cut it into nice strips and put that aside give our board a wipe down so moment of truth we're going to roll out one of our dough balls or I should say, my wife is gonna roll out one of our dough balls. And all we're gonna see is her hands moving gently across the board. Babe, take it from me. I tried rolling these things out before, but for some reason, I just can't get nice circles out of my dough. You've seen it in the other videos. One came out like a fucking square. The other one was kind of like a zombie head where some parts were deformed. But my wife comes out with really nice circles, so look at her attention to detail. Look at that ring right there in video frame. Look at that perfect dough circle that I did. I'm just kidding, my wife did it. We have our dough circle kind of just like we're doing pizza, but we're gonna turn it over, we're gonna crimp the edges, and we're gonna be ready to get this bitch in the oven. We're gonna get all three calzones on there and we're gonna bake them off. So, we're gonna basic bitch this and start off with pepperoni and cheese. And this one's for Vale. And this one's for Sweet Treats by Vale. Vale of Sweet Treats by Vale. If you haven't seen, if you haven't seen her videos yet, we'll put those up as well. So what we're gonna do is just get some marinara sauce, pizza sauce, Spaghetti sauce, doesn't really matter. Just pasta sauce is a little runnier, but you're good either way. And we're gonna put a bit in there, not too much. You just want enough to give a nice coating, and then we're gonna put the rest of our filling. Mozzarella cheese and some pepperoni. I've been told by my producers that I must rebrand this from basic bitch pizza to classic pepperoni pizza. <laughs> All right, so we have our pepperoni and our cheese. What we're gonna do now is take this flap and fold it over, which is a lot more nerve wracking than it sounds. Take that and pop goes the weasel. There's our basic calzone shape for our classic pepperoni pizza. 
Like we said, you wanna leave some dough on the edges and you don't want your ingredients all the way there because we need to wrap it around basically so those ingredients and the cheese doesn't ooze out. What you're gonna wanna do with your edges is you're gonna wanna kind of fold it in, fold it in, and then from there you're gonna start folding your dough in, kind of like what they do with dumplings, folding and pinching. And if it doesn't come out perfect, it's okay. This for me is nerve wracking. Arts and craft cooking, no problem. Getting on camera and talking, no problem. Having to do some arts and crafts, that's where they got me fucked up. As you can see, my folds here are really good and then they get, but that's all right. If you want, instead of folding it like that, you can take a fork and just crimp it down and get that old school, that old school toaster shooter look. But we're gonna stick with that because I think that's as good as it's gonna get. So. So we're gonna take that and we're gonna put it on our baking sheet. Twice more. And I'm gonna show you that my circles do not come out as good as my wife's. Why? I don't know. And there's my dough. Not as round, kind of like a rectangle oval type thing, but it's okay. Cause I love it and that's all that matters. And you can still shape this into an awesome calzone. As long as you flip it and you crimp it correctly, it's all good. So my calzone is gonna be a meat lovers. So it's gonna start off with the same base as the classic. Some sauce, some cheese, some pepperoni, but we're also gonna be adding in our bacon, our sachicha and ham, our red onions, and our roasted red bell peppers. Get this one and get it on there as well. All right. Our last calzone is ready to be assembled. As we said before, for this calzone, we're gonna be using our spinach artichoke dip as a base, which we got right here. So we don't need marinara sauce because that doesn't really go with the flavor profile we're trying to create here. Splat it on, spread it out a bit. Got the spinach and artichoke down. We're gonna top it off with some bacon. We're gonna go with some ham and some roasted red pepper, which further than adding flavor is gonna add some nice color pop to the video and to the dish. And this kind of looks, these kind of look like those Uncrustable, those peanut butter and jelly sandwiches they used to have in, in elementary school. That's the last one. Gonna pick it up. Place it right next to the monster we have on here. And these suckers are just about ready to go in. We're gonna put some slits on the top. That's gonna allow the steam to escape while these things are baking. And last, last thing before we get these in, we're gonna just hit them with some egg wash, which is just an egg mixed with some water. The tops get nice and brown and get all pretty looking. We're just gonna doesn't have to be too heavy of a coating. We're also gonna be throwing in some biscuits into the oven at the same time as our garlic bread substitute. If you want the recipe to that, that can be found on the box. All right, the biscuits are ready, the calzones are ready. Let's get them in the oven and we're gonna let them ride at 425 for about 15 minutes or until the crust is nice and golden brown. So let's get those in. And here they are. Beautiful, huge, they smell gorgeous, they look gorgeous, look at that cheese. And that's why we put those slits so that cheese wouldn't. So while these things are still hot, we have some garlic butter, which is just melted butter with garlic powder, a little bit of salt and parsley that we're gonna put over us over this while it's still hot so it kind of cooks in still. The focus is on our calzones and these are gorgeous. Now it's time to get a cross section. 
Look at that sucker. Look at that sucker. Woo! As Chef John of Food Wishes says, fork, don't lie. Crispy in three, two, one. Oof. Meat lovers, calzone. That is gorgeous. Woo! Let's do another one just cause we can. Here we got our spinach artichoke dip with bacon and ham. And gorgeous. That's why we put color in our dishes. For that color pop. And open. Hot pocket. All right, let's try this out. You can use a fork and knife or you can just pick it up and take a bite. That is great. Woo. If you like the video, hit the like button. If you wanna see what we're coming up with next, hit the subscribe button. This is great. I'm hungry, we're hungry, we wanna eat. Let's end this out. Stay safe, stay awesome, peace. Oh shit, I forgot one of our biscuits. <laughs> Hey everybody, this is Fulio of Echa de Porros Productions and today's Thanksgiving and just like last year we're gonna show you everything that we're making for Thanksgiving dinner in a more hodgepodge style which includes spatchcock turkey, mashed taters, southern green beans, clam chowder, and chipotle mac and cheese. Let's get started. Woo! So this is everything we're gonna be using for today's dinner. Here we have celery, onion, to make the mirepoix for, for the clam chowder and also for the southern green beans. We have our stuff for our mashed potatoes, our clam chowder, our chipotle mac and cheese, a big ass bag of green beans, and most importantly, our star, the turkey. So before moving on, we actually need to go back in the past uh, to show you how we spatchcock and got this turkey ready to dry brine. Let's go check that out. So we're back to the night before and we are going to prep our turkey by spatchcocking it and getting our salt and seasoning on this so we can dry brine this in the fridge overnight. As we've gone over before in last year's Thanksgiving video and in our spatchcock chicken video, we are gonna spatchcock this turkey, which basically means we're just cutting out the backbone and laying it flat. Once you get that flat and all on even ground, it's gonna cook a lot more evenly, so your breasts are gonna be nice and juicy, and the thighs will cook, come up to temperature at the same time. So, let's start off by getting the gizzards and all the stuff out of the cavity. So let's go, oh, this turkey packing. <laughs> That's the neck. And then you get this big ass cavity. Look at this boy. All right, definitely pat this sucker dry. You don't want your knife to slip. You don't want your hand to slip when you're cutting uh, out this backbone, which you're gonna cut it from the neck part here up until the little fundillo, the butt, the tail, the coccyx. So just be very careful, have a good sharp knife, and have a good handle on what you're doing. So, All right, once you have your bird flat, or as flat as it's gonna be, uh, our breasts this year are a bit lopsided, but that doesn't matter because all breasts are beautiful. So we are gonna do what's called a dry brine on this turkey, which is why we're starting the night before. All we're gonna do is get seasoning all on the meat, all on the skin, and then we're gonna let it sit in the fridge overnight uncovered. That's gonna allow the seasoning and the salt to penetrate the meat and to dry out the skin a bit so we get that nice crispy skin that we want. What we're gonna do first is uncover our breasts, and we're going to rip back expose these breasts and all 
their glory. There it is. And we're just gonna get our seasoning, which is just a combination of salt, paprika, thyme, all those Thanksgiving flavors. It doesn't really matter as long as it's something you want. Nice and salted. You can be very liberal with your seasonings because it's a good amount of meat. I think this is a 18 pound bird bigger than the one we did last year. Get all the exposed meat. The turkey will not mind you rubbing its breasts. Can put the skin back on. We're gonna take out our thighs. Once you get the skin nice and loosened up, you'll just be able to pop out like nothing. Uncover those thighs. And since we took out the backbone, the only thing here connecting this is skin. So we can manipulate this as much as we want to. Work some into the leg meat. Cover your thighs again. Just slip the skin back on. Nobody will know you checked out them thick thighs. But what we are gonna do next is now get our seasoning all on skin of the bird. Now, with our lopsided breast assist, we're going to let this sit in the fridge overnight uncovered. It's gonna let the seasoning work its magic, and we'll see you back tomorrow, which through the magic of video, will be right. All right, so as you saw, we cut out our turkey's backbone. It was a bit of a struggle because this is a big boy or big girl with thick thighs and kind of deformed breasts. But as we said, it's still beautiful. As you can see here, the meat has darkened a bit and that just means that the salt has worked its way into the turkey. Uh, we left it overnight, probably a good 12 hours we left it. While that's ready, we're gonna get everything else prepped so we can try and get all our dishes cooked at around the same time. So we're gonna put this sucker aside for now. We have the turkey waiting on the sides and now we're gonna get to marinating our ham. So here's a pretty unprocessed piece of ham. We don't really like the sweet glazes that usually come on these hams. So what we're gonna do is we are going to marinate it with our al pastor marinade that we've done before for our al pastor tacos and for our gobernador fries. But we're gonna liven it a bit up with some lemon and lime juice and we are ready. Well first, what we're gonna do is we are going to get some of this fat and trim it off of our ham because that's a pretty good amount of fat. It's gonna take some time for that to render down and some fat is good, but you don't want too much. Of course, if you wanna keep it, you can. As we usually say, as much or as little as you want. And we're just gonna put off that fat to the side and we should be ready. So we are also gonna make some scores in this, give our marinade some room to, to get in there. And then you can just go ahead and pour this on and then start massaging it into the meat from there. Of course, make sure your hands are clean. Constantly wash your hands when you're dealing with meat, uh, raw meats like the turkey and the ham for your safety, for the safety of the people you're cooking for. And once you have that nice and marinated, we can go ahead and put that with the turkey so it rests and then we'll get it in the oven uh, a little later once we got some more stuff going. Okay, so now we can start prep for our other dishes. What I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna cut up some potatoes for our mashed taters. So I personally don't mind the skin in my mashed taters, so it makes this easier. And it adds a little bit of texture. Right, and there are our potatoes. We're actually gonna go ahead and chop up everything, our green beans, our onions, our celery, and we'll get back for the actual dish assembly. Okay, so everything we're making today, we've actually done in a video before. We've done a spatchcock chicken. We're gonna make chipotle mac and cheese, which we just made a short out of, and the original video is still up. It's the first video on this channel. We're gonna do a clam chowder and mashed potatoes, all of which we've done on the channel before. We'll do a quick recap of what we need to do, but I'm not gonna show the full process. What we haven't done before is southern style green beans. And really, they're super simple. You just need to let them simmer for a while. Obviously, you need green beans. You're gonna need some bacon and you're gonna need some onion. That's kind of the basic of what you need. We're gonna get the bacon in our pot 
Then once that's rendered out and not too crispy, we're gonna throw our onions in along with the bacon fat and the salt is gonna draw the moisture out of the onions and help them get tender and nice and caramelized. Once we're done with that, we're gonna throw in our green beans. We're gonna fill the pot with chicken stock, water, uh, any kind of stock that you want to use. We're gonna get it just above the green beans and then we're gonna let it come to a boil. We're gonna lower the heat and let it simmer for at least one hour. We're gonna get that on the stove. We're getting the oven preheated to 350. We're gonna cook our turkey in there, our ham in there, and then once our chipotle mac and cheese is ready, we're gonna get that in there as well. So to recap, for our clam chowder, we're gonna start it off with the same base as the southern green beans. We're gonna get some bacon rendering down in the pot, and then we're gonna throw some onion and celery in there. We're gonna soften those up. Then we're gonna throw in our heavy cream, some stock juice from the clams, and we're gonna let that all come together, a couple bay leaves. And then we're gonna throw in potatoes and let it boil until the potatoes are tender. Then after the potatoes are tender, you're gonna throw in your clams for a very small amount of time, like three minutes, and they should be ready to go. For our chipotle mac and cheese, if you haven't seen the short or the video yet, we're gonna blend our chipotles with about two cups of heavy cream. Uh, along with your spices, your garlic. Then we're gonna go ahead and put our remaining heavy cream into our pot along with our chipotle mixture. Let that come to a boil along with a bit of a flour or cornstarch slurry to get it thick. Once it's boiling, we're gonna take it off the heat and then we're gonna incorporate our cheeses in there. We're gonna introduce our pasta into that mixture and then bake that off at 350 for about 30, 40 minutes. For today's southern style green beans, I also threw in the backbone of the turkey to cook along with the bacon, and it's gonna boil and simmer along with the meat, the green beans, and that's gonna add some nice turkey stock, some turkey flavor to our dish. We're not gonna eat the backbone, we're just using it and its bones to give us some great flavor. And there we have it, Thanksgiving dinner, of Echale Porros Productions 2020. We have our ham, turkey, southern green beans, chipotle mac and cheese, mashed taters, clam chowder. And this is just dinner. Dessert, we probably won't show off in this video because we're gonna keep it for the next video, but keep on the lookout for that. But it's time to try it. Where can you go wrong with a big ass turkey leg? This ain't as big as the ones at like fairs, but it'll do. So juicy. Mmm, that juice from the turkey, that juice from the butter, delicious. This I'm excited to try, first time trying to make it, some southern green beans. What can I say? I make good shit. Chipotle mac and cheese, it's a favorite and it's awesome. As money bags would say, it has a nice cheesy taste. Mashed taters. Some al pastor ham, still delicious. <laughs> time chowder, time chowder, dude. And wash that all down with a nice Jack and Coke. This has been Dinner by Echale Porros Productions, Thanksgiving 2020. We hope everyone had, has or had a great Thanksgiving. Maybe you'll watch this next year for 2021 and hopefully everything's better by then, or at least a bit better by then. But anyways, I gotta go change because everyone else looks good and I still look bummish. But let's end it here. Happy holidays. Stay safe. Stay awesome. Peace. Hey everybody, this is Vale from Echale Porras Productions. And today we're gonna be showing you guys how to make a pumpkin bread cheesecake. Let's go over our ingredients. First, we're gonna have 15 ounces of pumpkin puree, two eggs, three fourths cup of vegetable oil, one cup of sugar, two and one half cups of flour, one teaspoon of vanilla extract, one teaspoon of baking soda, two teaspoons of baking powder, and one teaspoon of salt. One and one half teaspoons of ground cinnamon, one fourth teaspoon of ground nutmeg, one fourth teaspoon ground ginger, and one eighth teaspoon of ground cloves. So into a large bowl, we're going to be adding our pumpkin, our eggs, 
vanilla extract, sugar, and oil. So today I'm going to be using my stand mixer, but you can definitely just use a whisk as well. So we're just going to mix everything until combined. Mix, 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 mix. Always be sure to scrape down the sides just to make sure that everything is fully incorporated. Now we're going to add in our flour, our baking powder, baking soda and salt, and all of our spices. Now we're just going to mix it until it's combined. Be sure not to over mix it. Mix, 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 mix. So here I have a 10 inch cake pan that I've just buttered a bit on the bottom and lined with a circle of parchment paper. Into the pan, we're just going to put in all our batter. Just be sure to level off your cake so it's all even. Now we're going to put this into a preheated 350 degree Fahrenheit oven for about 35 to 45 minutes or until a toothpick inserted into the center of the cake comes out clean. Now we're going to be going over our ingredients for the pumpkin bread cheesecake. We have 24 ounces of cream cheese, one cup of sugar, one cup of heavy whipping cream, one teaspoon of vanilla extract, one half teaspoon of ground cinnamon, one eighth of nutmeg, one eighth teaspoon of ground cloves and one eighth teaspoon of ground ginger. So into our large mixing bowl, we're going to add our cream cheese, our sugar, spices, and vanilla extra. Now we're just going to mix this up. Now we're just going to pour our cheesecake mix on top of our cooled cake. Try to spread it out and get it as even as you can. Don't be scared if it goes above a little bit. Now we're going to just cover this with plastic wrap and this goes into the fridge for at least four hours to chill, but overnight is preferable. And so we'll see you in the morning. So after letting our dessert sit in the fridge overnight, here it is. What do I do now? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm practicing. I am trying. That I should be telling you. So now I'm just gonna be decorating with some whipped cream and some cinnamon. Now let's cut into this. I have the power of God and anime on my side. Don't fuck with me. <laughs> Now let's cut into this. Oh yeah, two years. <laughs> Erica's been waiting two years for this, so here it is. Let's try this out. Cause even though she did all the work, I'm gonna bite it first. That's just how it works. <laughs> I've been cooking all day and this is the type of sugar I need to wake me up and give me a sugar rush that's gonna make me crash late. That's delicioso. One more. My wife, my director's telling me to hurry it up. Cut. <laughs> but I don't want to. Oh, Vala is doing the outro this time. Be sure to like and subscribe, share it with all your friends and family, and leave a comment down below what you wanna see me make next. And as always, stay safe, 
Stay awesome. Peace. Blah. I ate all that in the time it took for her to do the outro. <laughs> and I ate half of this shit. Peace.